Origins of Magritte's Art Career. In 1921, Magritte began his one year of compulsory military service before returning home and marrying Georgette Berger, whom he had known since he was a boy and whom he would stay with for the rest of his life. After a brief stint in a wallpaper factory, he found work as a freelance poster and advertisement designer while he continued to paint. Around this time, Magritte saw the painting The Song of Love by Italian surrealist Giorgio di Chirico and was so struck by its imagery that it sent his own work off in the new direction for which he would become known. Placing familiar mundane objects such as bowler hats, pipes, and rocks in unusual contexts and juxtapositions, Magritte evoked themes of mystery and madness to challenge the assumptions of human perception. With early works such as The Lost Jockey and The Menace Assassin, Magritte quickly became one of the most important artists in Belgium and found himself at the center of its nascent surrealist movement. But when his first one-man show in 1927 at the Galerie Le Sanitaire was poorly received, a disheartened Magritte left his homeland for France. The Treachery of Images Settling in the Perrault-sur-Marne suburb of Paris, Magritte quickly fell in love with some of surrealism's brightest lights and founding fathers, including writer André Breton, poet Paul Eliard, and artist Salvador Dali. Max Ernst and Joan Miro. Over the next few years, he produced important works such as The Lovers and The False Mirror and also began to experiment with the use of text, as seen in his 1929 painting The Treachery of Images. But despite the progress Magritte was making his art, he had yet to find significant financial success, and in 1930, he and Georgette returned to Brussels, where he set up an ad agency with his younger brother Paul. Though the demands of their studio left Magritte little time for his own work, over the next few years, interest in his paintings began to grow and soon he was selling enough to leave his commercial work behind. Surrealism in Full Sunlight In the late 1930s, Magritte's newfound popularity resulted in exhibitions of his work in New York City and London. However, the onset of World War II would soon alter the course of his life and art. His decision to remain in Belgium following the Nazi occupation caused a split between him and André Breton, and the suffering and violence caused by the war led him away from the often dark and chaotic moods of surrealism. Against widespread pessimism, he said, I now propose a search for joy and pleasure. Works from this period, such as The Return of the Flame and The Clearing, demonstrate this shift with their brighter palettes and more impressionistic technique. After the war, Magritte finalized his break with Breton's branch of surrealism when he, had, he and several other artists signed a manifesto titled Surrealism in Full Sunlight, a period of experimentation during which Magritte's created garish and provocative paintings followed before he's returned to his more familiar style and subject matter, including a 1948 reimagining of his lost jockey painted the same year as his first one-man ex exhibition in Paris, The Enchanted Domain and the Son of Man. With the arrival of the 1950s, Magritte enjoyed the ongoing of international interest in his work and continued his prolific output. In 1951, he was commissioned to paint a cycle of murals for the casino at Nac les Out, a town on the Belgian coast. Completed in 1953, entitled The Enchanted Domain, they were a celebration of some of his best-known images. More commissions around Belgium followed, as did major exhibitions of his work in Brussels and the Sydney Janus Gallery in New York. Some of his most important works from this period include the painting Golconda, The Glass Key. He also introduced the now iconic apple into his work, most recognizably in 1964's The Son of Man, Later Life and Legacy. Despite having been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 1963, Magritte was able to travel to New York City for a 1965 retrospective of his work at the Museum of Modern Art. Magritte also explored other media during this time, making a series of short films that feature his wife, Georgette, as well as experimenting with sculpture. After a period of prolonged illness, on August 15, 1967, Magritte died at the age of 68. 
His work proved to be primary influence on pop artists such as Andy Warhol and since been celebrated in countless exhibitions around the world. The Magritte Museum opened in Brussels in 2009. Um, the first painting I would like to discuss that really captured my interest was this one, which is known as the Son of Man. And uh, to me, the Son of Man is a very confusing painting to me. But I agree with Magritte's statement that the apple kind of forces us to see what we can and imagine what we cannot see. It's almost annoying that we can't see the man's face, but that shows how life is. There's much more below the surface of some things that we cannot discover and must only imagine. Next one I would like to discuss is this one, which is called The False Mirror. In this painting, I think Magritte is making us think about what we see and what we can relate to what we know. We all have different perspectives on it, and at first, some thinking that the clouds and sky are a reflection of what the eye is looking at, or if the clouds and sky are what the brain inside is thinking about. Or even if the eye is an opening to another reality, Magritte is making us decide. And the final one I would like to look at is this one, which is called The Voice of Space. Once again, in all of his paintings, I think Magritte is making us decide what the contents of the painting mean to us. Some people may think that the orbs in the painting are alien spaceships with life forms in them, or some think that this image is what Magritte saw when thinking about what the voice of space would look like, but in the end, it truly is a mystery to all of us.